So I've had several students ask me um, questions about how I got my ham radio license and what was required. So instead of explaining uh, several times, I thought I'd just make a quick video and um, they could then uh, take a note of the URLs and other information that I couldn't remember at the top of my head right away. So the first thing to learn about uh, earning your first ham license is that there are three classes of uh, licenses. The first class is the technician class, second class is general class, and the third is the amateur extra class. Um, you cannot jump straight to amateur extra and take the exam. You must earn them uh, first the technician, then the general, then the amateur extra. Each license granted to the user basically allows them to operate and transmit on frequencies. So as you earn more classes all the way up to amateur extra, you're allowed to go on more frequencies. So you're allowed more frequencies in the VHF, the UHF, and the HF bands. Uh, the license lasts for 10 years, and in case you forget, you have a two-year grace period that the Federal Communications uh, Commission allows you to renew your license. So for example, if you move to a different location, and, in, and uh, you're, you know, you've had your license for 11 and a half years, you could go to that website below, simply click renew, and voila, you have 10 more years to use that license. The frequencies that are displayed on this graph um, show what um, you're allowed to operate on depending on what license you have. So the technician, general, and extra, as I said before, um, they allow different frequencies that those classes can use. In this case here in this graph, um, EAG, if we take a look at the key, uh, e stands for amateur extra, A stands for advanced, G for general, T for technician class, and N for novice. The novice and the advanced class do not exist any longer. Novice class um, privileges actually have been absorbed by the technician class, so you get a little extra benefit by only having to take the technician um, exam now. I did include the source at the bottom. Uh, just in case this graph isn't uh, readable depending on what you're viewing it on. What we have here are, are the different bands or the different frequencies that um, the amateur radio licensees are allowed to operate on. Uh, the colors represent the type of communication on those frequencies and the letters to the right represent which license is allowed to operate on that frequency. If we take a look at the 15 meter or the 21 megahertz, we see that E, A, G, N, as well as T are allowed to transmit on that frequency. So, woohoo! And if you take a look, there are a lot of them that you're allowed to transmit. And thanks to a series of consolidations throughout the years, the technician class is actually been able to transmit on more bands than ever before. So what's required to earn a license? Well, the first thing that you're going to need is the book. Here's the ISBN. It includes pretty good software uh, in the back of the book that allows you to take um, random tests or tests for each section as you're reading along the book. It took me about five weeks, but depending on you know how much time you have in your current knowledge of electronics, it may take less than two weeks. You're going to know when you're ready to take the test when you're passing the sections of this book at 80% or better. It's not very difficult. Um, once you're basically getting that 80% or better, the next thing you need to do is locate a testing location. Um, it's about 15 bucks. I don't believe they can charge more than that. For me, I ended up paying just 10 bucks. Um, you're going to want a cheapo calculator when you're studying for these exams. If you're spending more than $10 for the calculator, you're spending too much. Okay, so what isn't required to earn a technician license? Well, you certainly don't need a physics or mathematics degree, although that would certainly help. You don't need hundreds of dollars. The book on Amazon is 1965 as of August 10th, 2013. You certainly don't need a barrage of communications such as SWR meter, radios, antennas, or other equipment. If you had all these, you probably wouldn't need to take this test. And you certainly don't need to know any longer knowledge of Morse code. In 2003, some more consolidation was put and uh, it was no longer required. 
That being said, I've been on the radio for about five or six months now, and quite a bit of the uh, communication is and continues to be Morse code. It's quicker, it's faster, and you need very simple communication equipment in order to transmit Morse code. How to study. Well, don't skip any sections. Uh, there are a lot of information throughout this book, and sometimes you'll skip a paragraph thinking you know what it's about, and that kernel of information might be presented in one of the section quizzes three or four times. So don't, uh, don't really assume, I mean, if you know the section really well, I would say at least peruse through it just in case there's something that you need to um, beef up on. For example, coax sizes, um, and their SWR association with them. Use software included with this book. 80% better on each section is the best way to know you're, you're uh, ready to go. And utilize additional resources. Um, one resource that I used a lot was YouTube when I was trying to uh, get a better picture of what an SWR meter was. Um, the different sizes of coax. What should you do on testing day? The first thing, verify the location by going to this URL. Bring some ID. A legal photo and you also need to have your social security number written down so you know it or uh, your federal registration number I'll give you that URL in a moment you're gonna need two number two pencils with erasers and make sure you bring a pen uh, you're gonna need to sign your name once you pass your exam you're gonna need a simple calculator a ten dollar cheapo and money. Um, like I said, they normally ask for about 15 bucks. My testing location, the, um, the uh, couple that had it only charged me 10 bucks. Okay, so you've passed the test. Can you go home and start talking? Eh, not quite. You cannot communicate on the air. In other words, you cannot transmit on air until you receive your call sign. How do you find your call sign? by going to the URL that's in big bold on this page wireless.fcc.gov forward slash ULS forward slash um, you can look up the FCC database if you've registered for an FRN number at this site you can type it in there or you can just look it up by your last name once you do have your call sign you can then transmit so you can communicate with other hams you can build or tinker your own radios don't forget to renew your license. You have that license is good for 10 years and you have a two year grace period. And remember, it's completely free. You renew it at the same site here. If anyone has any more questions, please feel free to ask below. Um, the test didn't take very long, maybe 20 minutes. It was very congenial, um, no pressure. And when you walk out, you'll feel proud that you are now uh, legally certified to transmit and receive on those specific frequencies. So. Um, 72 to you all. Good luck. And my call sign is Kilo Delta 8 Victor Echo Oscar.